Okay, well, greetings, everybody, out there in television land, radio land, computer, computer land, <laughs> and telephone land. Today is the seventh day of the month of uh, February, 2015, and the 17th day of the Hebrew month of Shabbat. Hebrew calendar is a day ahead of us, as usual, as I've said over and over, you know, but, you know, you really cannot get ahead of God, and his calendar is determined by the beginning of each month is a new moon, and the new moon is uh, the, uh, little, the little crescent moon, as it appears right after the dark of the moon. So today is the seventeenth day of the month of Shabbat, no, not the not the eighteenth day. But be that as it may, uh, one of these days I think the Jews will get back to the calendar God designed and created for them, for His people. Uh, probably when they rebuild the temple or a house of worship up on the Temple Mount. And then maybe they will return to the ways of God and the Torah and the scriptures and take it more seriously. But they're definitely not doing that today as a whole. Even so, we are living in the end of this age and the twilight is deepening and the darkness is approaching and the end of the age is upon us. And it's time to draw near to God and to get right right in the sight of God. To seek Him with all our heart and soul, as David said in the Psalms. My heart pants after you, O Lord, as the deer pants after the water brook. Hungering and thirsting. And uh, we need to hunger and thirst for the things of God, and the righteousness of God, and the Word of God, and the Law of God, which is our life, and which is also our joy. And if we put God first in our lives, and discipline ourselves to serve and obey and follow Him, then He will bless us, and He will give us our heart's desire. And I think uh, one of my favorite scriptures is found in Psalm 37, and I would like to read this uh, this morning. <coughs> psalm 37, a Psalm of David. Beginning actually, and well, I'll, I'll begin at the beginning of the psalm, verse 1. David says, Do not fret yourself because of evildoers or the wicked around us today, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, you know, and all their riches and yachts and private aircraft and millions or even billions of dollars. God says, Don't be envious. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass. You ever mow grass? <laughs> Get the lawnmower out there and mow it down, it just lies there flat, cut off. That's what's going to happen to the wicked. And they're going to wither like the green herb that's cut off. Now the key, he says, verse 3, Trust in the Lord, Yahweh, Almighty God, and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. God is faithful. And then the key verses that really have been a lot to me over the years. Verse 4. Delight yourself also in the Lord. And he shall give you the desires of your heart. You know, you often forget that. 
But we need to delight ourselves, be joyful in the Lord, in Almighty God, in His Word. Be filled with delight in His Word. And if we do that, He will give us our very heart's desire. Think about that. I've thought about that over the years. I think one of my heart's desires was to have a good mate, a good wife someday, back when my, I was single all those years. And I prayed this prayer many times. And I also, my heart's desire is to have a place in God's work and to serve God with all my heart and soul. And God has made that possible too. That's why we're here and that's why this work is going forth. Because I desired to serve God with all my heart. And He has given me my heart's desire, this work to do, to proclaim His warning message to this end time generation before it's too late. Not just to proclaim the basic facts about Christ being the Messiah, but the in-depth truths of God's Word. The truth about the calendar and the holy days, the Sabbath, and the Passover, Pentecost, counting the Omer, the unleavened bread, Feast of Trumpets, the call to repentance, Yom Teruah, Feast of Judgment, or the Day of Judgment, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, and what it really means, and Shemni Atzeret, the last day, the eighth day, the new feast all by itself, and how it projects and pertains to eternity and our calling and our destiny as human beings, our great awesome potential what God desires us to be and to do in the future, if we prepare, if we get ready, if we commit ourselves to obeying God and following Him. You know, I'm just working this week on my new book, which is basically just about finished now, The Holy Days, The Mystery of the Holy Days. Now, I think it's going to be a smashing, absolutely breathtaking uh, book of profound and deep understanding for people, especially those who don't know the plan of God, they're going to see it revealed for the very first time, and a lot of the others of us are going to be reminded by it of the depths and the, of the riches of the mercy and great purpose of God in our lives. We need to be reminded there's a universe out there waiting for us. You know, and God is going to work out His plan. And this past week I was working on the cover design and I worked up several different covers. And Then uh, inspiration came to me uh, one morning as I was uh, meditating and praying and uh, uh, ending my sleep for the night. And, the thought just came into my mind, well, that's, you got the wrong cover. That those, The pictures of the Itrog and the Passover, they should go on the back cover with the explanation back there, but the front cover should really show the purpose and plan of God in a unique sense, a beautiful picture of a starry galaxy or a nebula in space, something dramatic would be good for the front cover. And then superimposed over the picture would be the words, Mystery of the Holy Days. And as this cover evolved in my mind, and I tried several different uh, approaches toward it, I finally got it right uh, yesterday. Mystery of the Holy Days. And then below that, uh, God's glorious plan, the awesome destiny of man. And 
then of course at the bottom my my name the author and I, I, again I think that's going to be a fantastic smashing uh, book and title and uh, cover and God opened my mind to just see it and then I had to struggle for two or three days to get the cover just right because I wasn't really too familiar with how to type the words over the, uh, the, the photograph, the picture, and then to get them sized right. But it, it took a while, but now I'm very pleased and it looks beautiful. And that book should be, I hope, brethren, it's out by Passover, just in time for the holy days, the holy day season this coming year. So, you know, God has called us and tells us that if we delight ourselves in Him, He will give us the desires of our heart. Uh, then, you know, I think it might be good to have a, the word sila put there because, in other words, meditate on this. Think about this. Think about the desires of your heart. What do you really want in life? Meditate on it. Think about it from God's point of view. Be sure it's right. Be sure it's something that's lawful. And uh, then, then ask God if it be His will to fulfill His word, His promise to give you the desires of your heart. And then it goes on, verse 5, Commit your way to the Lord. That is, roll off unto the Lord. My margin says, roll your way off unto the Lord, trust also in Him, and He will bring it to pass. Yes, He'll give you desires of your heart. He will bring it to pass. He will use you. You are one of His first fruits, one of those He is calling and using today. Your prayers are vital for the work of God. Your energy, your Bible study, your preparation, everything you do, brethren, has an impact on your brethren and on the people of this world who are hungering and thirsting and wailing and crying in anguish and pain, yearning desperately for the coming of peace and the kingdom of God. And they don't even know it. They don't know what's wrong, but everything is going to hell in a handcart today in the world around us. ISIS is exploding in the Middle East and Obama's kidding himself and feigning uh, ignorance and saying, well, the Muslims, they're 99.9% .9 peaceful. That's what he just said this past week. At a prayer breakfast for Christians, a Christian prayer breakfast, he had the audacity, the temerity, the gall to say the Muslims are 99% peaceful people. And he said we must not get up on a high horse because Christians also have butchered and raped and killed and maimed people. In essence, the Christians have a black eye too. And Christians are no better than Muslims. These Muslim extremists, so well, he won't call them that, but these extremist, fanatical jihadists, but he won't call them that, he, he's friends, he's friends, of, if not a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. This past week he invited the leading Muslim Brotherhood members in the United States to the White House, to the Oval Office for secret consultations between him and the Brotherhood. What kind of nefarious, evil, skullduggery and wicked plans were hatched in that secret confab? I'd ask you, brethren and people, listening carefully, you know, it was kept secret, and yet this was between the Muslim leadership in America and they support jihadism and Wahhabism and Hamas, terror groups in the Middle East. 
Now Obama and his administration want to put Hamas on the approved list and take him off the terror list. I tell you, it just makes me shake my head. We've been betrayed from taking over from within. And now this country, because we have rejected God, the giver of every true every truth, every blessing, and America has rejected him and turned to the paltry, glittering tinsel of this world and its God, which is Satan the devil. People don't know that, they don't recognize it exactly, but yeah, they don't know what they're doing. It's like, like it says in the Psalm, uh, rather Proverbs 14, verse 12, There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. America is going the way that seems right. People think, well, we, we need to befriend the Muslims and be happy be friends to the, the pagans and the unbelievers, and, and maybe if we make friends of the two billion Muslims in this world, uh, we can have peace, but you how do you how how can a how can, how can a rabbit let's say make friends with a scorpion? You, you ever hear the story about the the horse and the scorpion and the flood waters were rising and and they were in danger of drowning, but across the river there was this island. And so the scorpion said to the horse, uh, let me climb on your back and carry me over to the other side of the river and, and we'll live. And the horse looked at the scorpion and said, what? You want me to give you a ride? Why, why you'll kill me. You'll sting me with your stinger and I'll go into convulsions and die. And the scorpion said, well, why would I do that? If I did that, then I'd die too. Because we'd, we'd be in the middle of the river and the flooding is, you know, if, I didn't, if we didn't get over to the island, then uh, I would die. So, so I won't sting you, you know, you're my transportation. So the horse nodded his head, his muzzle up and down and said, well, all right. And the scorpion climbed on the back of the horse and the horse plunged into the river and began to swim across the river and got halfway to the other side and out came the stinger. And, he, and the scorpion stung the horse and said, I told you you are going to sting me. As the horse disappeared beneath the waves and the scorpion with him, the scorpion said, yes, that's right. But that's what we scorpions do. That's what we're born to do. Well, I look at the Muslims and their religion, and it is not a religion of peace, contrary to Obama's claims. All history shows us it's a religion of war, predicated on conquest and forcible conversion and rape and murder of those who don't Convert. Talk about it, that a little bit today. But that's the world we live in. And God says if we commit our way to Him, trust in the Lord, and He will bring it to pass. He will save us and deliver us and bring to pass our heart's desires. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light, the shining light of dawn and your justice as the noonday, that you will receive your reward in the kingdom of heaven, like the bright shining sun at the moment of its strength. And verse 7 says, Rest in the Lord. Rest. Wait patiently for Him. Don't fret because of the evildoers and those who prosper in their way because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass, those who plot and connive in secret, 
with their wicked plans and machinations. God says, don't worry about them. Seize from anger. Forsake wrath. Do not fret because it just causes harm. It just upsets you and your mind, your tranquility. Verse 9, for evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait patiently on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you can look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek, the humble, shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace, prosperity and peace abounding and overflowing. You know, that's a promise God gives us if we delight ourselves in the Lord, and He will give us our heart's desire. And the kingdom of God is right around the corner. Well, <clears throat> this morning, just to help prepare the way for the, the Bible study itself, the news, I've got the religious news that's come in. Number one on the items is voluntary Sharia law tribunal now is beginning in Texas. This is how it begins, the headline says. Yes, the Muslims are proliferating and the mosques are proliferating in the United States of America, the modern land of Ephraim, of Joseph, the inheritance of Joseph. And what have we done? We've invited the gods of the East, the pagan god Allah, and the Muslim religion to come in here and expand within our own borders like a Trojan horse. Now they're setting up voluntary Sharia law tribunals as part of our legal system. Oh, how perverse and perverted our nation has become. Meanwhile, Christians in Niger, Africa, ask for prayer. Seventy-two churches were burned down by Boko Haram an affiliate of ISIS and Al-Qaeda in Africa. And the fight in the war in Africa between the Muslims and the Christians is, isn't over yet, not by a long shot. Another interesting tidbit of news, legalized pot is the fastest growing business in the United States today. Colorado has legalized it, Washington has legalized it, and now legalized pot growing is the fastest growing business in the United States. And they had a show last couple nights on Hannity, on Fox News. Uh, Bill Bennett, who has written a book on America going to pot. And he shows that the pot being grown and used today, the marijuana, it is 15 to 30 percent more deadly than the pot that was used back in the 1960s and 70s in the hippie era. The new pot plants today, the marijuana is much stronger and dangerous. And, and he said the, the scientific studies are now in. And if you just smoke one, one joint of weed or pot a week over the years, beginning as a teenager, by the time you're middle-aged, you'll lose 10% of your mental capacity, 9 or 10% of your IQ. Your brain power will be consumed in smoke 
by the pot. Reminds me of an article I wrote years ago in the Plain Truth magazine on the dangers of marijuana. And I'd written, read a book by an author on, on drugs, a very good writer, and I wrote about a two-page article in the Plain Truth magazine on the dangers of pot, and I really blasted it. Well, <laughs> after that, someone put on my desk an article uh, copied uh, from Playboy magazine in their letters to their editor in which they took on my article and laughed it, laughed at it and made a joke about it and said it was all nonsense and that there's no danger to pot and there's no evidence and no proof and that uh, the, the sources I quoted were not reliable or something like that. Well, now, you know, that was, that was back around 1970, 1972. That's 40 years ago. And now the evidence is in and the books have been written and pot is dangerous. And yet America has been blindsided and blinded, mesmerized, hypnotized by the attractions of pot and the the spirit, the high, the uh, drug-induced uh, euphoria that it temporarily provides for people who become disoriented. And yet in the long run, it's very dangerous. And Bill Bennett was very strong on that. And the book is out there now, America Going to Pot, or something, something like that. Another item in the news, 70, uh, no, 15,000 young Gazan young people being uh, taught in Hamas terror training camps. Thousands of young recruits as young as 15 years of age are learning how to, their curriculum is, how to kidnap soldiers, how to use weapons, how to infiltrate the enemy in, in Israel through tunnels. It's the Hamas military, paramilitary training camp in Gaza. And that's Muslim, and that's uh, terrorists, and they are Muslim, and that's the name of the Muslim religion today. It's not a religion of peace. It's always throughout history been a religion of conquest. I, I could say, brother, read some books on it, or get out your, uh, <laughs> go find the Koran, and just read their own book, the Koran. It's full of violence, and about if your enemy doesn't convert, kill him, especially the Jew and the Christian. It's madness to deceive ourselves to think otherwise. in a magazine I received this past week called Israel My Glory. There's another article about the martyrdom of Christians around the world and the growing genocide of Christians. choice offered, according to the article, in the Muslim nations and other nations where Christians are persecuted, the choice is always the same. Renounce Jesus Christ and live or refuse and die. Or in the Muslim state, it's become a Muslim and renounce Christ and live or be beheaded or burned at the stake. This past week, the, the ISIS burned a, at the stake a Jordanian airman who was shot down over Syria. And this is the way the 
choice is given in uh, Khartoum, Sudan for example a woman was sentenced to death after refusing to renounce her faith in Jesus the 27 year old expectant mother was charged with leaving the Muslim faith to become a Christian, although she had never been a Muslim. But her father had been. The judge declared to her, "You gave, we gave you three days to recant, but you insist on not returning to Islam. I sentence you to be hanged to death. She replied, I am a Christian, and I have never committed apostasy. She never was a Muslim. Later, she repeated her affirmation of faith, saying, I am a Christian, and I will remain a Christian. Those who do that often wind up beheaded or hanged or dead in the world today. On page uh, 11 of this magazine, it says, Wholesale Genocide. On October 6, 2014, word reached the world that Boko Haram, Islamic terrorists, had burned down 185 churches in Nigerian towns they had conquered. They raided the villages, ransacked and destroyed homes, and caused some 190,000 people to be displaced, including 200 Nigerian girls, whom they captured and carried away into virtual slavery to make them their forced wives or to sell them into prostitution. They're the Solomon slaves. As terrible as those numbers are, the article says, the slaughter in Nigeria is small compared to the roundup round up of people being killed by ISIS Muslim terrorists, ravishing the Middle East. ISIS, Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, is at war in a bloodthirsty quest to establish an Islamic caliphate, which it has declared, which is to rule the world, according to them. First it will rule in the Middle East, then Europe, then America, and ultimately the whole world. Now why is it Obama can't call them Muslim fanatics? Why is it he will not call them Islamic jihadists? He just won't do it. Their often stated overriding objective is the annihilation of Christianity. Their leaders have declared Christianity to be enemy number one. Their commitment is on display in the great number of Christians they have slaughtered, churches they have destroyed, and artifacts and institutions related to Jesus that they have obliterated. In a recent conference in Jerusalem, sponsored by the International Christian Embassy, and the World Jewish Congress, it was reported across the Middle East in the last 10 years, 100,000 Christians have been murdered each year. It's 100,000 murdered every year, 10 years, that's a million Christians murdered in the Middle East. That means every five minutes a Christian is killed because of his faith. 
and him think the great tribulation is here and has begun? It will only expand and grow and metastasize and get worse. The article says, Today, massive numbers are being slaughtered. And hardly anyone blinks. Doesn't make sense. The world is in darkness. It's not taking note. In our otherwise seemingly advanced culture, we have become immunized to a generation of human beings who are dying for their faith. We are not evincing a sense of compassion on Christians being slaughtered. But I see shows on television asking for donations for people to help prevent dogs and cats from being put to death, or animals being slaughtered, or small children growing up in foreign lands and in poverty asking for donations for them. But what about all the Christians being slaughtered? That's not on people's radar scale. The slaughter is being done in genocidal proportions. However, he says godlessness comes with consequences. Look at Hitler's Third Reich. They rejected God and then killed six million Jews and, and millions of Christians and led to World War II and a bloodbath around the world. The Muslims blame America for their unhappiness and their angst, and they blame the West. Rather than looking into their own hearts and their own minds and their own way of life and their own religion, which causes them to be so miserable. It's not the fault of the West, it's their own heart. You know, God says, and the Muslim religion doesn't realize this or understand this, but God tells us plainly in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9, the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, that is incurably sick, my margin says. Who can fathom it or understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. Even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. The heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. So says the Word of God in Matthew chapter 12. Christ himself spoke to this issue and he says, Beginning in verse 30, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy which will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. Because they, they just don't understand. They don't know that Christ is the Messiah. They are in ignorance, so they often speak against him, as the Muslims do, 
Well, that can be forgiven. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, the spirit of love and truth and knowledge, that will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. And that's what these Muslim fanatics are doing. They are doing evil works and thereby speaking against the Spirit of God, contradicting God's Spirit, which is a spirit of love and joy and peace. They are violating that and speaking against the Holy Spirit by their words and their actions. So Christ said, verse 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. The actions, the fruit of these extremists and fanatics like ISIS and the Muslim Brotherhood is evil, it's corrupt, it's bad, it's perverted, it's poison. And so that's what Christ says about them. Verse 34, brood of vipers, he says, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. A good man of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things like love and mercy and compassion. But an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word that men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. So let's go on. Uh, the news. I also received an email letter from Temple Mount Faithful this week. And Gershom Solomon and the Temple Mount Faithful in, from Jerusalem, Israel. And in their letter, they're sending out a call to the nations to wake up before it's too late. And they write, the Middle East is changing fast almost every day. Islamic violence with its cruel and murderous power is gripping the region with new recruits who arrive from western countries and becoming well-trained lethal fighters of the Islamic Jihad cause. These human monsters are messengers of the devil. Thousands have been killed by them by cruel and in, cruel and inhuman ways that have never been seen before. Savage, satanic methods that were never used in its history of warfare. And nothing is being done by the world to stop this terrible genocide before it's too late. Obama isn't doing a thing. He, 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 he learns of an American journalist beheaded by ISIS a few months ago, and he went out and played several hours of golf. That's how he took it, just went out to play golf. The world isn't taking any action to stop this hemorrhage, this bloodshed in the Middle East. It's all propaganda. The newsletter says the process has already begun. This genocide 
is beginning to spread throughout the world. The main goal of Islam is to destroy Israel and the United States, whom they call the Great Satan. It is not just the goal of ISIS and other Islamic groups like Hamas in Gaza, but also Iran. The president of Iran says Israel should be removed from the map of the world. And some American uh, map makers and book atlas makers have done just that. To appease the Muslims, they've removed the state of Israel from their world maps. But they had to apologize. That's the trend today. But these Muslim fanatics intend to establish an Islamic caliphate and eventually to rule from Jerusalem over the entire world. So says the Temple Mount faithful. They want to replace God and Christ and fulfill the prophecies themselves that ruling from Jerusalem. And, the letter says, in shocking numbers, many young Europeans had traveled to Syria and joined ranks with ISIS. And Americans are doing it too. They had ISIS signs and placards at the Ferguson riots in Missouri. And America turns a blind eye, just ignores what's happening in front of our very eyes. a letter sent to me by a friend, uh, an article written by Frosty w uh, Wooldridge of NewsWithNews.com, December 18, 2014. Uh, the title of the article is Impregnating America with Muslims. Consequences to our society. We are inviting them over here, thousands every year. Obama is inviting thousands of Syrian Muslims to settle in the United States because of the war going on in Syria. And he has vowed that America will be a Muslim nation by 2016. Now, brethren, that's just next year. His whole family is Muslim. His brother, is, or half-brother, is a Muslim agitator and a fundraiser, assisting the Muslim governor of the Sudan. And Obama himself is very likely a closet Muslim Brotherhood member. His administration, he has permeated them with Muslim in official positions throughout his government. Well, in this article, he says Muslims carry an entirely different, opposite world view on women's rights, religious rights, free speech, and religious choice. December 16, 2014, an Australian Muslim named Man Haron Monis held 17 people hostage in a downtown Sydney restaurant. He killed two of them before he himself was killed. They say he was a lone wolf, but the fact is, Islam drove his actions toward violence. In the Quran, chapter 4, verse 89, it says, quote, They desire that you should disbelieve as they have disbelieved, so that you might be all alike. 
Therefore take not from among them friends until they fly in Allah's way. But if they turn back, then seize them and kill them, wherever you find them. And take not from among them a friend or a helper. The Quran says, quote, convert or kill all non-believers, end of quote. Muhammad himself, who was an illiterate and savage tribal warlord in Asia and Asia, and who would be inspired the religion of Islam, beheaded and behanded anyone who opposed him. Today Muslims disrupt every western country where they settle, where they inhabit. It's the nature of their beast. Muslims lead with violence when they can't get their own way. Once they get their own way, they lead with more violence to convert those around them. To be truthful and faithful to the Muslim religion, Muslims ultimately must degrade and kill all other people who follow any other religions. Islam itself means submission. Submission to their God their Koran, their way of life, their Sharia law. There is no freedom of religions in Muslim lands. All other religions are cast out, converted, or made to pay a tax, and the people live as slaves. In December 17, 2014, a Pakistani Muslim slaughtered 141 children at a school, all in the name of Allah, their God. This past summer in Moore, Oklahoma, an American Muslim beheaded a fellow worker at a processing plant in America. Last year, a New Jersey Muslim beheaded and behanded two Christians for violating the Koran in New Jersey. One American Muslim in New York beheaded his wife for filing for a divorce. Isn't that something else? She, I guess she couldn't take his high-handed ways. The Muslims are the ones who are riding the high horse today. Another Muslim is sitting in a jail cell for first degree murder. Another father killed his daughter, nor in America, by running her over with his car. He sits in a jail cell for premeditated murder. Ironically, Muslims kill an average 5,000 wives and daughters every year in Islamic countries, and they get away with it. They enjoy the right to kill their loved ones in the name of, quote, honor, unquote, so-called honor. It's a disgrace, and now they're bringing it to America, and we are so blind-eyed, blind, and stupid we allow it. We elect a Muslim leading, Muslim loving president who hates the way of God and Christianity, and who, who makes fun of the Bible and Christianity and mocks the God of the Bible, and says he's never heard a sweeter sound than the Muslim call to prayer. This past summer, the article says, African Muslim Bo 
Boko Haram captured 300 African girls, raped as many as they could take along with them, and then sold them into slavery. And no one can find them today. The list goes on and on forever. Today in America, Islam wages its centuries-old war against Christians, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, and every other religion on the planet. Nevertheless, NBC's Brian Williams and others say each individual act of jihad is nothing but a lone wolf or an insane person or a misfit acting out his hatred. Of course, Brian Williams, he's the one that lied about being attacked and being under fire in a helicopter in Iraq as they exposed him this past week. His own helicopter pilot said no, his helicopter was nowhere near where there were, were another convoy of helicopters was being shot at by the Iraqis, but the convoy he was in was nowhere near there and was not shot at. So Brian Williams, with all his fanciful stories and lies and braggadocio, has been exposed as being a liar and a hypocrite. And yet he is the anchor for the news on NBC News. You can't believe those people. They are such liars. Dr. Ali Gomad, Grand Mufti of Egypt, has said, Muslims must kill non-believers, whoever they are, unless they convert to Islam. They're commanded by the Koran to kill all idolaters, and if you believe in the, the Christian God or the Bible, or if you're a Jew and believe in the God of the Bible, then you are, in their eyes, an idolater. You know, they have it all backwards, because Allah is the idolatry. There, there is now evidence that the name Allah was, he was, Allah was a, one among about 300 different gods worshipped in the Arabian Peninsula at Mecca. And when Muhammad came along, he picked that one to exalt him and make him, call him the supreme god. But if you go back into ancient history, there was a god called Allah and Alat, one male and one female, and they correspond to Nimrod and Semiramis of Bible history, the beginners of the idolatrous system of this world. So that's just one more branch of the idolatry fostered on the world by Nimrod and Semiramis. Allah is just another name for Baal. The Quran chapter 9 verse 5 says, So when the sacred month months have passed away, then slay the idolaters wherever you find them, and take them captives and besiege them, and lie in wait for them in every ambush. Then if they repent and keep up prayer and pay the poor rate of tax, leave their way free to them. According to the article today, as of 2014-2015, around 7 million Muslims live in America. They fled bloodthirsty poverty, misery, and tyranny in their own countries. Yet here in America they continue pressing for their own religion in their own way of life. But saying that our way of life offends them. Our religious beliefs 
offend them. And they want us to change and become like them. Interestingly enough, in 1899, Winston Churchill wrote these words. Individual Muslims may show splendid qualities, but the influence of the religion paralyzes the social development of those who follow it. No stronger retrograde force exists in the world. Those were the words of Winston Churchill, written in 1899. Part two of this article by Frosty Wooldridge continues with the theme of Muslim consequences in America. If we tolerate this religion in our midst, which our government is doing, by inviting thousands more to come and settle in our country every year, so we are sowing the seeds for our own fiery holocaust and destruction. He says, when you follow the Fort Dix, six Muslims who attempted to commit mass murder on the U.S. base or the Fort Hood killings by Major Hassan, a Muslim, subway bomb plots by the Denver, Colorado taxi driving Muslim or a Times Square Muslim last winter or the Boston Marathon Muslim Brothers who set the bombs at the Boston Marathon, or the beheadings now continuing at a dizzying pace in our own country. You stand eyewitness to America's demise into a multicultural morass from which we may not recover. The balkanization of the United States has begun. That means a splitting up and subdividing. Even with Muslim Sharia zones and Muslim cities being fostered in America, just as they are in Western Europe today. The United States, <clears throat> he says, expects to legally import over 100 million immigrants within 30 years. They all hold different world views. What does their presence do in America? They fragment and fissure, create fissures and fracture our national ethos, our national moral fabric our own standards of morality. According to Samuel P. Hutchington in his book The Clash of Civilizations, he says it is my hypothesis that the fundamental source of conflict in the new world will not be primarily economic. The great divisions among mankind and the dominating source of conflict will be cultural. Nation states will remain the most powerful actors in the world affairs, but the principal conflicts of global politics will occur between nations and groups of different civilizations. The clash of civilizations will dominate global politics. The fault lines between civilizations will be 
the battle lines of the future. And that's very reminiscent of the book of Revelation and the, and the first and second woes of the seven last trumpet plagues. The clash of civilizations, north against south and west against the east. Apparently Americans today are just blinded and don't see what's happening. None of the major networks will address this problem. They, they just are mum, keep their mouths shut. They're afraid to talk about it. The government won't talk about it. They're trying to convince us all that the Muslims are peace-loving. Obama says they're all peace-loving except for one-tenth of one percent. And on polls and research they showed on Fox News last night, out of the two billion Muslims on earth, it's not one percent that are fanatic and jihadist. In polls taken among Muslim societies, Palestinians and others, the approval rate for the jihadists and the, the terrorism is more like 30 to 40 to 50 percent among the Muslims. Not one-tenth of one percent. They support it. The Palestinians cheered when the American Trade Towers went down in 2001. They cheer when America suffers. Foremost goals among Muslims, he says, is to occupy the White House. Secondly, to push Sharia law over America. In Barack Obama, they succeeded with the Muslim in the White House. He features 10 Muslim Americans on his staff. Only time will tell as to the voting, voting their Sharia law into our country, but it has already begun. It's already well on its way in Europe, he says. Once Muslims gain control in silent numbers, they overwhelm a host country to implant their own culture, just like a virus overwhelms the host being, carrying the virus. In France today, you see 70 no-go zones where French police, law, and culture surrendered to Sharia law. Under Sharia law, women lose all their rights. And now it's coming to America. The article goes on, Islam offers no age limit for marriage of girls under Sharia law. A man can pay a dowry and sign a marriage contract with parents of a toddler girl and consummate the marriage at age nine. Recent cases in Yemen and Saudi Arabia exposed the tragedy when eight-year-old girls filed for divorce from their over 50-year-old husbands. And one Muslim authority challenged the Saudi marriage high official, <clears throat> Dr. Ahmad al-Mubi, who stated in 2008 in an interview on LBC TV, he said, there, are no, there is no minimal age for entering marriage. The Prophet Muhammad is the model we follow. End of quote. Muhammad 
raped endless teenage girls. Well, chopping off the heads of anyone who disagreed with him. And he is the model they follow. The jihadists. They're not fanatics. They are true blue Muslims according to the Koran, which makes Obama a liar and a hypocrite. Pulling the wool over the eyes of Americans and deceiving us with his blather and his empty rhetoric. The article concludes, Our country, America, stands in the crosshairs of a multicultural nightmare bequeathing violence upon us as our Congress and President dump another 100 million legal immigrants under this civilization within 30 years. We need to reduce all immigration to less than 100,000 annually and no more Muslims if we hope to survive the 21st century. We citizens, he says, must stop kidding ourselves. We stand eyeball deep in trouble. Eyeball deep in trouble. And he brought it upon ourselves. And another article from Newsmax magazine. January 30, 2015, it says, Muslim Brotherhood meets with State Department, declares open jihad. Just days after the Obama State Department played host to a delegation of leaders assigned or aligned with the Muslim Brotherhood, the Islamist group itself has called for a long uncompromising jihad against the leaders in Egypt. Now Egypt overthrew the Muslim Brotherhood and General Sisi took charge and they are allied against ISIS and the Muslim Brotherhood. But America, of all the paradoxes, we are allied with the Muslim Brotherhood, supposedly, and yet we say we're against ISIS, but we do nothing to stop them in the Middle East as they control most of the northeast part of Syria and the northwest part of Iraq. And they're, like I said, they're metastasizing like a cancer around the world. And Obama hides his eyes and goes and plays golf. He will not, he does not want to persecute his Muslim brethren. So he says they're not violent. 99.9% .9 are peace loving. And that is another crock of BS for the ages. Our State Department is aligned with the Muslim Brotherhood. And the signs are getting more and more desperate as we continue to allow that to influence our foreign policy and our government and we may well be if Obama has his way largely a Muslim nation by 2016 that seems incredible that seems incredible but he said that and when he was elected president, the Saudis boasted and said, we have our own man in the White House.
and Muslim legend says a tall black man would rise up in the West and for the Muslims not to fear him because he is on our side. Well, maybe we will discover soon whose side Obama is really on. He persecutes and attacks the Christians. He does nothing when Christians are beheaded by ISIS and thousands are put to death. And he stands by idly and just watches and says nothing. Then he goes and plays golf, his favorite pastime. Meanwhile, America is inviting hundreds of thousands of these people into our country to settle and become our neighbors. With their attitude, do we need that kind of neighbor? The world is in spiritual darkness today. Rabbi Shlomo Riskin. In a recent article in the Jerusalem Post, talked about the plagues upon Egypt in ancient Egypt when Israel was held captive. He talked about the ninth plague, which was a plague of darkness. It was a palpable darkness, a darkness that can be felt. And normally darkness is just an absence of light. So how can a darkness be something that is felt? Well, he says in his article, herein is depicted a spiritual, social darkness, a veritable blindness on the part of the Egyptians, who refused to see their Hebrew neighbors as their siblings under God their relatives. Therefore, since they were the more powerful, they enslaved the defenseless, able-bodied Hebrews and murdered their defenseless baby boys. The girls they saved alive for their own sexual pleasure. And Shlomo Riskin says, I write these lines with trembling fingers after a horrible, horrific week in which 12 individuals were murdered in Paris. In the offices of the magazine Charlie Hebdo in an extremist Muslim attack. The style of the magazine was that of satirism. They satirized the Prophet Muhammad. Two days later, January 9, four individuals were murdered in Paris in a kosher supermarket. Their sin was buying kosher food. Think about it. Brethren, the frightening aspect of this is that it comes on the heels of an extremist Islamic explosion, not only within the Middle East and Asia, but within Europe as well. The peaceful Islam of the Sufi and moderate Sunni variety The Islam which gave the world translations of the Greek mathematics laws and philosophers has given way in our age to the extremist Wahhabi Islam exported from Saudi Arabia. Wahhabism which is seeking world domination. Jihad of conquest, 
by the sword around the world. That's what's on the march today. Obama notwithstanding. And, Shlomo Riskin says, the world is sleeping at the wheel. Iran is being allowed to continue to develop nuclear weaponry and intercontinental ballistics missiles which they now have which can reach America. And Obama says, we want to negotiate. What is there left to negotiate? He does not want to impose sanctions, so he's giving them a free ride, a free pass to nuclear weapons with which they intend to destroy America. Who could figure? How bizarre. <clears throat> European countries are siding with Muhammad Abbas and his request for UN recognition. Even after he makes a pact with the devilish terrorist group Hamas. Islamic State is on the march, beheading innocent people, taking over more and more territory in Iraq, and America is putting up too little opposition, too late. We're kidding ourselves. Says Shamo Riskin, Sharia's domination is every bit as dangerous as Nazism, Hitler's Nazism, and to every and to even it is even more fanatically determined to make the world free of non-Islam, free of all other religions. The world once again is helping, is being engulfed in darkness. We are returning to the dark ages. Our response is negligent, weak, ineffective. The religion of Islam, he says, is being hijacked by his fanatic, mono satanic Islam. And that is what's happening today. Islam is on the march, and you know, there is a passage in Revelation <clears throat> Revelation chapter uh, 9 talking about the plagues that lie ahead of us in the future. And John says, The fifth angel sounded, verse 1, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. That represents an angel. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened up the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke from the pit. And out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth. Now in the book of uh, Nahum the prophet in the Old Testament, locusts are a type of soldiers. Assyri Assyrian soldiers. 
these locusts here are military men coming upon the earth. And to them was given power like the scorpions of the earth had power. And they were commanded not to hurt the grass or the green thing or any tree, but only all those men who do not have the seal of God in their foreheads. And they were given not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. With torment like that of a scorpion when it strikes a man with its poison. In those days men will seek death and will not find it. They'll desire to die and death will flee from them. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared to battle. On their head were crowns of something like gold and faces were like the faces of men they had hair like a woman's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions to sting in their tails, and power to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, or destroyer, but in Greek his name is Apollyon, means the same thing. And that plague will torment men five months. He's talking about war between the world and Islam, the West and the world and Islam. And that leads up to the final woe in World War III, as we find the sixth angel sounds, and then the final war to end all wars breaks out, leading to the intervention of Christ to usher in the kingdom of God before mankind annihilates itself. These things are fast approaching. The world is getting set for doomsday. The clock is ticking down. The Muslim threat is rising up. The scorpions are getting ready to sting. And brethren, only those who have the seal of their God in their forehead will be spared. We need to draw close to God and ask Him for His seal of protection and pray constantly that we may be counted worthy to escape and to survive to the coming of the Lord Yeshua, HaMashiach, Jesus Christ our Savior. Pray on these things. Amen.